Next, we can talk about transformations on a qubit. Transformations are described by unitary operators. And also unitary operators can be visualized on the Bloch sphere. In very general terms, you can say a transformation is a map that maps a measurement to another measurement. And we said graphically a measurement corresponds to an axis through the Bloch sphere. Um, so it maps an axis of the Bloch sphere to another axis of the, the Bloch sphere, yeah, geometrically. So let's think of the observable Pauli X uh, that we just discussed, yeah, which we visualize as this uh, axis along the, um, it's actually not a coincidence that this goes along the X axis of our coordinate system here. Um, and then we can map that to say the axis going along the, the Y axis of our coordinate system with the same measurement values attached to the ends. Yeah, so this is important. Yeah, you always have the same measurement values. And then there exists, there exists uh, a transformation that maps the first observable to the second observable. And uh, you see that geometrically, um, when you have such an, such an axis, the two ends are, are antipodal. And we said that antipodes on the Bloch sphere corresponds to orthogonal states in Hilbert space. Yeah? So it's clear from this geometric picture, or this geometric picture reflects the fact that a transformation maintains orthogonality. Yeah? So the two ends of your axis, which are orthogonal states, must be mapped to another pair of states, which is still orthogonal. And there is um, there's a very general theorem by Wigner that says that when that an arbitrary transformation that preserves orthogonality is either unitary or anti-unitary. Now we won't go into anti-unitary transformations. These are transformations that involve taking the complex conjugate of a state. And in in uh, physics, they correspond, for example, to the time reversal operation. Yeah? But this will not concern us here in quantum computation. We will stick to um, unitary transformations. Uh, so the, this, it, it goes both ways. Yeah? So we know unitary transformations preserve orthogonality. This means geometrically um, preserving Antipodes are mapped to antipodes, and it, the logic also goes the other way around. Whenever we have a map that maps arbitrary antipodes to antipodes, it must be a unitary transformation. Now this goes, we can take this even further. Um, it is always possible to write a unitary transformation in two-dimensional Hilbert space in the following form. We can always factor out a phase factor. That's the e to the i beta times another operator, um, which I denoted by r. And it's always possible to write this operator r in this exponential form, it, it's always possible to write it as the exponent s of minus i, then some angle gamma over 2, and then a real three-dimensional unit vector n times a, the vector of Pauli observables. And here's another way of writing it. You can, you can expand the exponential as, as a cosine 
of gamma over two times the unit operator minus I sine of gamma over two. And then this scalar product um, unit vector N times a vector of Pauli operators sigma. I will show you in a minute how this, in an example, how this, um, how this looks like. The, the gamma is an arbitrary angle between zero and two pi. The vector N, as I said, is a three-dimensional real vector in, in, in three-dimensional real vector space, um, normalized of length one. And the sigma is also a vector with three components and the components are themselves observable. So these are the Pauli observables X, Y, and Z. In the lecture, I'm not going to prove this representation. I'm not going to show you um, that the, um, the, an arbitrary unitary operation in two-dimensional Hilbert space can always be written in this form. But this is, uh, this is an, ex an, an exercise on your problem set yeah, to prove this par parameterization. So if we, if you believe, if you believe me uh, for the moment that in two-dimensional Hilbert space, a unitary operator can always be written in this form, parameterized in this form, then I claim, and again, this is a homework problem. This is on, on your problem set, um, that this unitary transformation can be visualized as a rotation on the Bloch sphere. So let me show you exactly how this looks like. You have, you have an arbitrary state psi on the surface of your Bloch sphere, then you apply the unitary operator, and this takes you to another pure state, the transformed state, u psi. And you can visualize that as the result of a rotation around some axis n, which is described by this three-dimensional real unit vector n, by an angle gamma. And this is precisely the angle gamma, which appears in the formula on the left-hand side. Yeah. So the claim is, and without proof, that's part of your homework, um, that a unitary transformation always corresponds to a rotation up to this, uh, this uh, phase factor that you take out. Uh, this operator R that remains corresponds to a rotation on the Bloch sphere around the axis N by an angle gamma. Let's consider as an example, once again, the operator Pauli X, because the Pauli X is not just an observable, it's also at the same time a unitary operator. Uh, we know that um, the Pauli operator is Hermitian, but we also know that its, its square is equal to the unit operator. And this implies, of course, that x dagger x is equal to the unit operator. And that's the defining property of a unitary operator. And so the Pauli, all the Pauli operators are unitary at the same time. Now remember that this rotation operator at the form cosine of mm, gamma half times the unit operator minus i sine of gamma half. And then we have here this a unit, three-dimensional unit vector n scalar product with this um, 
vector of Pauli operators. Now, let me write this explicitly. So this is n x times Pauli x plus n y times Pauli y plus n z times Pauli z. Okay. Now, if we want to, to write the Pauli x in this form, then obviously the cosine must be equal to zero. Now, um, the cosine is, so we must have zero times the unit vector. This is the case if the angle gamma is equal to pi. Right? Um, then if um, the, the angle gamma is equal to pi, then we have the sine of gamma half, that's sine of pi half, this is equal to one. So then we have minus i nx um, poly x, then we have minus i and y poly y, and we have minus i and z poly z. Uh, I omitted one little aspect. I said every unitary operator can be written as a phase factor times such an operator r. And I forgot the phase factor. So I have e to the i beta times this form of the rotation operator r, okay? And now we want to choose the components of the unit vector and also the phase factor such that we get Pauli x. Now, since Pauli y, Pauli z don't uh, appear, the y and z components of the unit vector must be equal to zero. The x component of the unit vector well, since it must be a real unit vector, this must be equal to one. And then we have still a prefactor minus i. This has to um, cancel with the phase factor in front, e to the i beta, beta. We can achieve that if we say this is equal to i, which is the case if beta is pi over two. So we can write x, poly x, as e to the i pi over two. And then the, uh, the round bracket. Now the round bracket is, is a rotation operator by the angle pi about the axis characterized by the unit vector with the components one, zero, zero. And so you see in this example, Pauli X is a unitary operator and it can indeed be written in the form as I claimed, a phase factor times a rotation operator. And this rotation operator describes a rotation around now this is a rotation around the x-axis in the coordinate system by the angle pi. So you'd um, take the result of the hand with calculation, indeed Pauli x can be written in this form and, and Pauli x corresponds to a rotation by the angle pi around the x-axis. And now you can uh, think about what the other Pauli operators correspond to Pauli y and Pauli z. Yeah. Think about that. That's also that's part of the new problem that I uploaded today. Yeah. So how can you interpret Pauli y, Pauli z as rotations on the glossary?